Um, please do me a favor and grab a copy of God's Word. There should be plenty all around the church. They're on tables. They're on the ch- uh, the, behind the seats, and the, ch- uh, the, the slots there in front of you. I'm, it's it's kind of weird to... You got pews in this place, you know. That's kind of freaking me out. I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't even know how to say the word pew. You know, it's, it's freaking me out, Jerry. Freaking me out, man. I'm telling you, it's freaking me out. But there's uh, Bibles in front of you in the pew. Okay, I, I'm okay now. Okay. So, so please do, do me a favor and, and grab a copy. And, and we're going to be uh, continuing in our series in the Gospel of Luke. And, and the Bibles that you see, these blue Bibles, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 1. Now, the Bible verses, many of them we will share, uh, will, the, the reference will be up on the screen. And, and the page number that you see on the screen will correspond with the blue Bible. My hope is that if you don't need a blue Bible, it's because you have your own Bible and you're on your Bible app. And... <clears throat> and, and <laughs> And you're, or you have your own Bible. Who has their own Bible here? Ah, that's awesome. I love that. I, lo- I love you all, but I love you guys the most, man. You have your own Bible. That is awesome, right? Okay, so, so that's awesome. And, and so um, don't just listen to someone who has a microphone in their hand or on their face. You have the Word of God at your disposal. So make sure that you check Everything that I'm telling you and make sure that it's correct because our eternity is in the balance. That's a big deal, okay? Um, so uh, we, we, we started a series uh, last week studying through the Gospel of Luke because we want, to, we want to get to know Jesus. You know, we started last week, we talked about how Jesus says that he's going to, he's going to build his church and, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And, and he's going to advance this thing called the kingdom of God, and and he says the way for this to get done is to lift up Jesus. And when you lift up Jesus, Jesus draws people to himself. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're going to spend some time, probably a year or so, and we're going to go through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to find out about Jesus, like what these people said in the video. Who was this Jesus anyway? Because some of us have some false impressions. Some of us have been told a little something from mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, and it might not be true. You can go on Google, and that doesn't mean it's true, amen? And so we, need, we have the Word of God that tells us exactly who Jesus is, what Jesus taught, what He did, what He's doing right now, who you are in Him, and we want to find out the truth. Now, the reason why we want to do that, we talked about this last week, is that God says that He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so we talked about this last week, that, that God has given us emotions. And, and we're supposed to release those emotions to Him. They're, they're, crea- they're in you for His glory. So, so when you come in and you, you worship something, and, and you, you yell and you scream and you dance and you lift your hands high and you clap, or maybe you hear something and, and you're in here and you're weeping. That's cool. But listen, you don't want to release those emotions to something that is not worthy of being released to, right? I don't want to just worship some crazy spaghetti monster. I want to worship the real God. Are you with me? So, so that's what we're trying to do. We want to know the truth so we can worship with our spirit. So I want to start here. We're in Luke chapter 1, but if you're totally awesome. You can put your finger in Luke chapter 1 and you can turn to Isaiah chapter 9. So, so a long time before Jesus ever was in the flesh here on earth, he was spoken of. There were, there were people that spoke of this person that would come. And, and this is an example here in Isaiah chapter 9, this Old Testament, this, this, this old Jewish dude named Isaiah, about 800 years before Jesus ever comes and puts on flesh and comes to this earth, he says this in Isaiah 9, 6. Are you there? Okay. He says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulder. Side note, that should be a big exhale for everyone right now it let me tell you something it doesn't matter who wins 
Jesus is king. Okay. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace, you ready for amen? You guys ready for this? Will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. That's no four-year term, yo. That's forever. So this is what is stated 800 years before Jesus comes in the flesh. And now 800 years goes by. Now I've got to stop for a second because i got to give you some effect. Because if I just say 800 years and jump right into the next sentence... You won't feel that. Granny's going to be 90. I love Granny. She's really old. 800 years later, Jesus got his new disciples. Follow me, he says. And in John chapter 1, verse 46, a couple of his disciples are hanging out. 800 years later, and Andrew... Not that Andrew over there, but another Andrew. He says, we found the Messiah. And Philip says, we found the person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And this other guy, Nathaniel, he's like, Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. Well, how could the... Let me just, yeah, ha. How, can they, how can anything good come from there? The Messiah, no less? The one we've been waiting for forever? The rescuer, the savior is going to come from Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. You know, Nazareth, if you don't know, is, uh, is this itty-bitty, back, back then anyway, itty-bitty little village. It's about this big. And, and, and I didn't live back then. But if you research, most scholars will tell you that at the time of Jesus' birth, there was maybe 100 to upwards of 400 people in this little town. Nothing's going on there. Just a little village out in the middle of nowhere, northern Israel, some farming, some shepherding. Joseph was a carpenter. It's not like Jerusalem. Jerusalem was this big city with trade and it was the center of religion. <coughs> and people came from all around to celebrate all these festivals and Jewish holidays. And so there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people frequently attending uh, celebrations in Jerusalem and going there for commerce reasons. Not Nazareth. Nazareth to Jerusalem is like Paisley to New York City. Yeah, nobody goes to Paisley. There's no like big pilgrimage to Paisley, right? Just doesn't happen that way. Not ripping on anyone if you're from Paisley. If you're from Paisley, you're probably packing, so just uh, ex excuse me. I'm sorry, right? What good could come from Nazareth? This little podunk dot on a map that nobody visits. Where there's nothing going on. Well, let's look in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, and let's just see what can come to Nazareth. Starting in verse 26, this is what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth is the mother of John the baptizer. So in her sixth month, and she was an old lady who got pregnant, and that was a miracle, but in this pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel. You know there's only two angels in the whole Bible that are named? So it's a big deal. Michael and Gabriel. And he sends this angel Gabriel to Nazareth. Now we talked about the angels last week. They weren't like little things that are hanging on your rear view mirror, like some little guardian angel that you bought at Spencer Gifts for 250. These are massive glowing 
warriors from heaven who push back darkness. Right? These are big, scary things. And that big, scary thing, one of two named in all of Scripture, show up in Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now, we don't really know much about Mary. We don't know much about Mary's family. We don't know much about Joseph. And we don't know much about Joseph's family. We do. <laughs> this is Mary and her husband's name's Joseph. Just saying. It's a pretty cool church. But I will say this. No, for real. <clears throat> and guess what their son's name is? Gabriel. Okay, so I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm serious. So, 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 so we don't know much about Mary and we don't know much about Joseph. We don't know much about their family, but we do know this about Mary. She has a plan for her life. And, and it might not be a good plan. It might not be the plan that that, 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 that the world thinks is awesome. It may not be the plan that you would think is awesome for her, but she has a plan for her life. She, she, this, this girl, she is betrothed. This, this translation says engaged. She's betrothed to, to this Joseph. Betrothal means it's like a promise. The parents get together and they say, you know what, I think my daughter and your son would make a good match. They're going to get married, so we got to promise that. It's a guarantee. That's what's going to happen. And in the Jewish faith, the youngest you could do that was someone who was 12 years old. Now, I have a 12-year-old daughter. That's kind of wacky for me. That's kind of weird for me to think of Adriana in marriage. But that could happen back then. So, so she's a minimum of 12, and a betrothal would last about a year. So, so she's a minimum of 12, possibly getting married at 13, but she could be anywhere upwards of 16 years old. We don't really know. It doesn't say. <coughs> she's a virgin. And she's just going to live a modest life being Joseph's wife and raising Joseph's children out in this little town that nobody visits. It's just a little single stoplight town. Nobody goes there. And that's the life she's going to live. Now, this was a, a culturally accepted way to do things. The parents decide, this is what you're going to do, and the kids just do it. Amen. Whew. We should just stop right there. That was enough for the night. Amen. So, so the angel Gabriel, listen to this, the angel Gabriel is sent by God himself to this girl in this town. Someone seriously important, a serious somebody to what the world would say is a serious nobody to a place that's called nowhere. And, and why, does he do, why does God do this? I have one word. It's grace. It's because he wanted to. Because that's what he wants to do. It's his grace. It's his grace. And he says, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. And then the, the, I think the most um, legit, understandable, justified uh, part of the whole text is right there. Confused and disturbed, Mary tries to think what the angel could mean. Now, I, if you put yourself in Mary's shoes, right, you can understand why she's feeling this way. Like when she looks around in her life, like nothing's happening. She lives in this little podunk town. She's going to live this little modest life. And I'm sure she's not looking around, most likely, and going, man, this is, man, this life is crack a lacking, man. This is everything. The, the Lord's favor is all upon me. I, I found favor with the Lord. My life doesn't scream God's favor when she's thinking about her life. But, but God is about to rock her world. And he's about to rock the world through her life. He's going to create life in her that she is unable to create. She's a virgin, right? 
She's unable to create this life in her. But God can. He's going to change her plans. He's going to change her future. He's going to change her, her, her purpose in life. Everything changes, and guess what? That's exactly what that same God wants to do with you. Exactly the same thing. He wants to give you a new life. You can call it born again. You can call it saved. You can call it regenerated. Born of the Spirit. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died, and behold, the new man. Right? It's a new person. That's what he wants to do for you. He wants to give you a new future. Ultimately, what's that mean? You're going to go to heaven, because i got news for you. Outside of Jesus, you ain't getting there. And, and he, wants to give, he wants to give you new priorities and a new perspective, and he wants to shift and change your schedule, change your agenda. And he wants to give you a new purpose. He doesn't want you chasing things for yourself anymore. He wants to give you a new purpose. His new purpose is pretty simple. It's to worship God and advance His church. But that's what He wants for your life. That should be the center of your very existence. A new purpose. This was my life, but now this is my life. It's totally different now. And so she's confused. She doesn't understand what's going on. She doesn't have any idea at that moment that God's about to change her whole life. That's all she's looking at is, I'm looking at my life and I'm thinking, how could, how could God say that I found favor with the Lord? How, how am I like something special and different than all the rest? Because that doesn't look like it from where I'm standing. And so God being so gracious, He's about to upload into Mary, the life change. And you see it in verse 30. He says, don't be afraid. I don't know about you, but if, I, if the angel Gabriel popped his little face into this place right now, I'd be scared to death. Don't be afraid. Yeah, right. The angel told her, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. Now that's big news, right? So now it's starting to make sense. It's starting to make sense. Uh, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Now it's starting to make sense. Because now he's saying why you're favored. Well, you're going to have a son. That's huge. See, see, I don't know about nowadays. I'm not a woman. But, but I know that back then, if you didn't have a child, you felt worthless. You felt like that was, that, that was, that was like a place where you, if you didn't have kids, you were somehow less. That you hadn't fulfilled the purpose for your life. And so to, to go childless was, was rough on a woman. To be barren, that was hard. And people looked down on that. And so to hear the angel say, you're going to have a son, that's big news. That's something to be excited about. So now the door's open a little bit. And he under, she understands, okay, I'm favored. I'm going to have a son. That's awesome. But then he adds a little something to it. Oh, by the way, your son is going to be the king of Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but if the angel Gabriel came into this church and said, Moses, you have found favor with the Lord, and Jackson is going to be the president of the United States, I would be pretty psyched up about that. Dads, are you with me? Or that, would, that, would, that would pump me up. So, so I can understand now where, where maybe she's not as confused anymore. God's, he, he, he's talking to her now. He's, he's opening up the door and he's telling her what's going on. <coughs> but here's the thing. God throws a curveball at her now. So he says you're going to have a son. That's good. He says you're going to be, he's going to be the king of Israel. That's awesome. But, but, but then he throws her a curveball and he, and he says he'll reign forever. His kingdom will never end. See, that's where it gets a little bit weird, right? Because now he's throwing some eternity stuff at her. 
And here's a little 12, 13, 14-year-old girl in Nazareth. She's not exposed to a whole lot in her life. And now she's, she's having this angel show up and start talking eternity stuff to her. And, and everyday people, we, we struggle with eternal stuff, don't we? To, to, to wrap our minds around the eternal is probably why. Our lack of our ability to do so is probably why seats are empty in churches. We can't understand the eternal. We, we don't comprehend it. We can't conceive it. And so we, we only think of the temporal, and I'm fine now, and I'm good now, and I got this, and someday maybe. But no, eternal, forever, never-ending. And so Mary's kind of confused about this stuff. And i got to tell you right now, it takes a work of God's Holy Spirit to conceive and to comprehend eternal, eternity in the mind of a person. You, you cannot comprehend that on your own. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about where people struggle with eternity stuff. In John chapter 4, uh, Jesus goes up to this woman at a well. Many of you know the story. And he, he offers, he makes this amazing offer to her. He says, uh, drink the water I give and you'll never thirst again. And the lady doesn't get it. She's like, oh, awesome, awesome. Can, can you give me some of that water so I'll never have to return to the well? <laughs> Right over, she, doesn't talk, she doesn't even thinking about the water. She's thinking about the well. She's like, oh, great, I don't have to do my chores anymore. Hallelujah. <laughs> right? That's what she's thinking of. It goes right over her head. Uh, how about this one? He says, uh, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. In some translations it says, the I am is here. And I have food you know nothing of. And the disciples, you'd think they would know kind of a little something, right? And they look at each other, and it says right in the Bible, they look at each other and they go, did somebody bring him some food? <laughs> like literally, that's what it says, right? It's stupid. They, right over their head, they don't get it. And, and Mary struggles with that same thing, because God's talking eternal throne. And, and listen, kings, it doesn't matter how awesome you are, how powerful you are, you don't live forever. But, but, but this angel is saying, your son is going to be the king and his, his reign will be forever. And her answer is not like, wow! She's like, but I'm a virgin. She's still thinking about the, she's in the flesh still. She's not thinking about spiritual things. She's not thinking about eternity. She's like, wait a minute. Like, I know you just said that my, my son's going to be an eternal king, like a king that lasts forever. But yeah, forget about that for a second. How am I going to have this kid? She's still thinking about the fact that she's even going to have a child. We just don't get it. We just don't get it. But, but I love this, though. Just, just as a side note, I love her response. Because it's far different than Zachariah's response when the angel came to him. And said, you, you and your wife are going to have kids. And, and his response was a little bit different. It's in 118. He says, how do I know? He looks at the angel and he doubts God. He says, how do I know this is actually going to happen? He doubts God. Mary doesn't doubt God. She understands. But she's like, but I, I get it. I believe it. But, but, but I'm a virgin, so how's this going to happen? It's not that it's not going to happen. It's not that she doesn't believe it. She doesn't have doubt. She's just curious. How is this going to happen? It's a much better response. And so, and so God honors her curiosity, and now here comes the Holy Spirit. Here comes the Holy Spirit. If you read on in the text, it says this. Um, the Lord God will give him the throne of his David, ancestor David. It will never end. And Mary asked the angels, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So in other words, he's like, all that stuff that you believe, just it's going to be covered. That, that doesn't matter anymore. The Holy Spirit's going to do a work that you can't even understand. It's going to overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible <coughs> with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. 
May everything you have said to me about me come true. And then the angel left her. The Messiah is coming. 800 years after Isaiah spoke of this coming Messiah, this son that the, everything would rest upon, it's coming. He's coming, and it's going to be her son. Imagine that. All the people in this world, and God chose you to have his one and only son. I mean, talk about a changed life. Here she is, totally poor, unpopular little farm girl with nothing. And now she's about to become the most important woman who's ever lived. She's going to birth God. She's going to raise God in her house. Can you imagine the life change in this woman's life? So let's, let's take a moment and let's just talk about this Mary. Okay, let's talk about Mary. Mary was amazing. Mary's an amazing woman. So some people, they disregard Mary like she's nothing. And some people exalt Mary. But we want to find out what God's Word says about Mary. Now I would just say this, that the Catholic folks, they've got the market cornered on Mary. And, and I don't know, who, look, look, Catholic roots run deep in our, in our country. And, 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 and some of you may have been Catholic. Some of you may still identify yourself as Catholic. I don't know. But let me tell you something. If you grew up Catholic, you, you recited some Hail Marys, didn't you? A any, anyone? Ra ra just raise your hand. You, know, you got it memorized? You got it memorized? A couple people? Here, let me see. I think we got it up here on the screen. You put it up there? Look at that. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So you probably said that over and over and over and over again, right? That was part of growing up as a Catholic. But let me just tell you something. And, and we're on a journey of truth, right? Because we want to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so we, wanna, we want to find truth. And I'm just telling you, that that prayer right there exalts Mary much higher than God's word exalts her. And we, we need to confront that. Let me, let, me, let me just explain to you what I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, you see here that, that people are asking Mary to pray for us. To pray for us. Uh, first of all, I've ha I have to admit something that I have made an error in judgment over the years. And so I'm going to come to you now. If I can't be honest with you, then I can't expect you to be honest with each other. It says, pray for us sinners. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not a sinner. The Bible says there is no room for sinners amongst the godly. There's two groups there, isn't there? You may sin, but that's not your identity any longer. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. They're not a sinner anymore. The Bible says we all fail in many ways. So that's sin. But it doesn't make it who you are. It might be what you do, but it's not who you are. So the, the Bible says here, Mary, pray for us sinners. Somehow the Catholic folks are asking this amazing woman to pray to God on their behalf. 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 7.25 says he, Jesus Christ, lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. Romans 8.34 says that Jesus is seated in the place of honor at the Father's right hand, pleading for us. And last but not least, 1 John, you can go there, I want your eyes to see it. I don't want to make a claim that can't be supported with God's word. 1 John 2.1 My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin 
But if anyone does sin, let me ask you a question. Who's going to sin? The Bible says if you're without sin, you're fooling yourself, right? So we're all going to, right? But if anyone does sin, that's me, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. There's one. There's only one that intercedes for you. There's only one in heaven pleading on your behalf. And his name is Jesus Christ the Lord. Here's the second thing wrong with that prayer that we saw up on the wall. It says... Hail Mary, full of grace. Again, uh, this Bible is attributing to Mary that which is reserved for Jesus alone. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> in, in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, it starts out by saying this. Some of you might remember this. It's a it's familiar passage. It says, In the beginning was the Word. <coughs> and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, I'm already confused with the rest of you. All right. <clears throat> I, I, he's both. It doesn't say what the word is, though. It just says the word. And it says, the word gave life to everything. That's awesome. And then down in verse 14, it says, and that word put on flesh and dwelt among us. Now I think we can figure out who that was, right? Who's the word? Jesus Christ. So he makes his dwelling among us. And then it goes on to say, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Listen, there, there's only one person. First of all, the Bible says that nobody has ever gone to heaven and returned except Jesus Christ. And the only person that, that is, has this amazing glory, like that far exceeds everything else's and everyone else's glory, like their fame, their fortune, their power, their authority, their position, their awesomeness is their glory. And, and, the, and the one that has the most glory is Jesus because he's the only one who's full of grace and truth. No one else has ever been full of grace and truth. You know what it means to be filled with grace and truth? That means that there's not a smidgen. Go like this, right here. There's not even this much room inside of you for anything other than grace and truth when you're full of grace and truth. And nobody, you know what that means? That means you're perfect. And I only know one perfect dude. And his name was Jesus Christ. That's who he is. So we can't attribute to, to Mary that which is reserved for Jesus Christ alone. We're just lifting up Jesus here. That's all we're doing. Here's the third thing. And I want to refer back to a, tech, a, a, a verse that I read to you just a moment ago. Hebrews 7.25. Where it says, He, Jesus, lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. And the part I want to point out there is this He lives forever part. See, see Jesus Christ came and He was born as a baby in a little stable in this manger, and then he grew up, and, and he lived a perfect sinless life, and then he was accused when he, when he did nothing wrong, and, and he was put on a cross, and he actually died, and he was buried, and then he actually rose from the grave and showed himself to people like I'm right here right now. And then, after 40 days, he ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, pleading your case for you. So he, he, the grave didn't hold him. He's alive. right? So it says that he lives forever to intercede on your behalf, but I got news for you, Mary did not. Mary did not. Mary passed. Mary can't hear your prayers. And Mary can't offer prayers anymore. And I will tell you that Mary is an amazing woman. She was incredible. And I'm quite sure that if she was alive today, she would probably, you know when someone says, hey, will you pray for me? I bet you she'd say yes. I, I guarantee you she'd say yes. She was an awesome woman. But she's not alive today to pray on your behalf. Catholic people lift up Mary high. Some worship her 
and they pray to Mary. And let me just tell you something. Mary is not an object of worship, but she is an amazing example of faith. And she should be honored for such faith. Honored for such faith. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Look how she responds. Now, here's this little girl in Nazareth. Nothing going on in her world. Someone's picked her future for her. Uh, that's the guy you're going to marry. That's where you're going to live. And that's the way it is. Who likes it when people tell them that? Yeah, not too many hands going up right now, right? But that's what was happening. And now the angel Gabriel has come and said, not only has your life changed, but you're going to be the most important, blessed woman who's ever lived. Not only did she have Jesus, she had Jude, Jesus' half-brother. He wrote a book of the Bible. She had James, another half-brother of Jesus. Guess what he did? He wrote a book of the Bible too. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Like, her, her life, 180, man. She's the most important woman to ever live. And how does she respond to this sudden and momentous shift in the status quo of her life? This revolution, if you will, in her life. How does she respond? Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. That's freaking awesome. That is awesome. God comes to you and says, this is what I want. And you just go, absolutely, sir. That's what he's looking for from every single one of us. Total obedience. Absolute humility on her behalf. You know, she lived in a small town. A couple hundred people. She's pregnant. What are people going to talk about? I mean, it's a small town, right? Everyone knows everyone. Maybe they call her a, you know, I can't say because there's some little kids in here, but you know. Bad words. You know what I mean? A little hussy. That's the church word. That's the church version of what I was thinking about. You know what I mean? But she doesn't care, right? Because God said so. All this stuff's going on, but I'm totally in. That's amazing faith displayed. Now, worshiping God well includes not worshiping that which does not deserve worship, right? He said you're supposed to worship one and only God, right? Well, listen, Jesus Christ deserves your worship. No one else deserves your worship except Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus prays for us. Jesus saves us. Jesus reconciles us. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus' blood cleanses us. Jesus is our rest. Jesus is our creator. Jesus is our sustainer. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus is our life. And Jesus is our king. And Mary was and never will be any of those things except him. And so let's just close right here. And I'm going to invite the worship band to come up and, and we're going to have an opportunity to, to worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. But let me, just, let me just end here. Why is Mary so amazing? Is Mary to be worshipped? That's the question. Because a lot of people do. Is Mary incredible because Mary carried Jesus in her belly? Is that why she's so amazing? Is that why she's so honored? Well, let me let the Scriptures speak to you. Elizabeth, it says here, was there and she's hanging out with, with Mary. And she's filled with the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 41 of chapter 1, he's, she's filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, Elizabeth, verse 42, gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. And then she explains why Mary's blessed. She said, Mary, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. That's why Mary's awesome. That's why Mary's awesome. The Bible says she's blessed above all women because of her faith in God. 
Verse 37 says that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. And so God could have chosen any woman, couldn't he? He could have chosen the, 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 the richest, the most famous, the most beautiful, the most influential, the one in the big city that would have had the biggest influence on the world. He could have done anything he wanted, any way he wanted. But he chose Mary. He chose Mary. And it was Mary's faith, the Bible said, that made her blessed above all other women. That's what makes Mary so beautiful. And that's what makes Mary an example of faith to follow. So here, here's where it comes to, to your part of the night. Jesus wants to enter your world and change it too, just like he changed Mary's world. He took a little a woman who, who, whose future was secure. This is what my life was going to be. And then Jesus came along. Anyone? And he changes things. And, and Jesus wants to do that with you right now. He wants to come into your life and completely change it. He wants to give you a new life. He wants to, he wants to have you be born of the Spirit. He wants you to, to, to be a new creation with a new future and a new hope and a new purpose and a new mission. He doesn't want you to live for yourself anymore. He doesn't want you to live for, 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 for your family anymore. He doesn't want you to live for you. He doesn't want you to live for your country. He doesn't want you to live for anything else except this. For him. That's what he wants you to live for. And the awesome thing is that he promises that if you go all in like Mary did, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he will provide all that you need, including a secure spot in glory with him, forever so the question is just this are you all in are you in it, listen if, you, if you're not all in that's cool you can make a quality choice to go all in right now the, the Bible says that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master you can the one who has authority over all of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, gave you the authority to choose who your master is going to be. And he's given you that choice right now. You can choose right now to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Not in word, but in deed. Like I shared with Travis, when Jesus says jump, you don't even ask how high. You start jumping. When he says sit down, you don't ask where. You drop. That's it. That's what lordship is. Not some funny, fake, empty Christian platitude that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And then you act like a total idiot all the time. No, no, no. What we're looking for here, what Jesus is looking for, is a genuine follower of him. So I give you the opportunity now to do that, to go all in. So if you're all in, why don't you bow your heads and pray for those that may not be right now. Part of being a loving family is to pray for the best for those that are not yet in your family. To pray for the very best for those people. And in this room, there's people that you don't know, Revolution family. You don't know them. What would be your prayer? What would be your best for them right now? What would you pray for them right now? Would you pray for success in business? Would you pray for healthy relationship at home? Would you pray that they sold their house or got a new car? Or, whatever? or would you pray for their, their eternity? Would you pray for their eternity? Would you pray that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their one and only Lord and Savior forever? Pray that for them. And, and, and listen, if you're if, you ha if you've been saying all along that you're a Christian, but, but you really haven't been following the Lord, maybe you've been sharing worship with other things instead of just Jesus, maybe it's time to repent of that. And just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I've offered what is only yours exclusively to another. I've cheated on you. And I don't want to anymore. I genuinely repent of my sin. 
You know what's so amazing, loved ones, is that the Bible says that by no means will Jesus turn away anyone who comes to him. That's awesome. You can turn to him right now, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you can turn and run into the loving arms of Jesus Christ and make him the savior of your life. Lord, I'm going to offer up my prayer as a mouthpiece for everyone in this room. and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll help me to do this and do it well. Lord, I, I don't think there's a single person in this room, including me, that could say I'm all in. I, I, there's no one in here that could say that I offer my worship to you and you alone. Because oftentimes I've given of myself and my resources to other things so much easier than I've given them to you. And for that, Lord, for that I am desperately sorry. Please forgive me. I thank you for your word, which is true, that tells us that if any of us will confess our sin to you, you are faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we receive right now, we receive your forgiveness. And I pray, Lord, now that as we receive your forgiveness, that you would restore to those of us that have called on your name once before, that you restore to us the joy of our salvation that we once knew. But now, Lord, we're, we're praying, all of us that have bowed our knee to you, we're praying for those that have not yet done that. We lift up these precious people to you that you love. And Lord, we want to love them. We want to know them. We want to love them. We want to wrap our arms around them, support them, and encourage them. And the best way we know how to do that to love them is to lift them up to you and ask, Lord, that you would work on their heart. That in some mighty way right now, through a weak vessel that you would bring them to a place of salvation in Jesus. That they would let go of their stubbornness and that they would let go of their own agenda and let go of their own ways and their own tastes and, and, and just embrace yours. To humble themselves before you like the verse said, they would humble themselves so that we might see you work and be glad. Bring your salvation to people that have never received it before. Let them experience your love. If there's anyone in the room, and there's nobody looking. There's no, I'm looking around. No one's looking. If there's anyone in here right now that would like to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, that doesn't mean you have to come to church every week. It doesn't mean you have to put money in a basket doesn't mean you have to talk a certain way, walk a certain way, wear certain clothes. It just means you start a relationship with Jesus. If you want that, just lift your hand. Praise God. Praise God. Awesome. Awesome. Now that your heads are still down, there's three in this room, so that's... Thank you. Lord, we would like to offer this right now as, your, as a prayer. First of all, all of us that are believers already would like to thank you for the three that have raised their hand and would like to be part of your family. We praise you for that. And now, Lord, we'd like to just offer up a prayer for those that have raised their hand and they don't need to say it out loud. They can just say it in their own spirit, under their own breath. Your word says that if we confess that you are Lord and believe that Christ was raised from the dead, that we'd be saved. So if you're one of those three, you can just simply say something like, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I believe that you are my Lord. And I believe that you were raised from the dead that I might have life. saved. I 
thank you for tonight, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we give thanks to God for those three?